I'll be reading from Zechariah chapter 3, um, Joshua the high priest. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Mm. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from you. Again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. While the angel of the Lord was standing by, while the angel of the Lord was standing by, um, and the angel and the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, "Thus says the Lord of hosts: If you will walk in my ways, and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house, and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among these who are standing here." Now listen, Joshua. The high priest, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, indeed they are men who are a symbol for who are a symbol. For behold, I am going to bring in my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua on one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave an inscription on it, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day declares the Lord of hosts. Every one of you will invite his neighbor to sit under his vine and under his fig tree. And this is the word of God, friends. Father, we, we, we thank you for the wonder of your word, the power of the written, the red word. Thank you that you continue to love and guide your people through the living word itself. And Father, even as we gather today with uh, such a privilege to be in your house, with such freedom, such a joy to be able to worship you and to acknowledge your grace and your presence. And we're fully aware, Lord, that our country and the, the globe is, is struggling, so many realities that are happening. But we come as your people, perhaps some here today who are fully, fully convinced that you're on the throne and, and all is well, perhaps others not so convinced asking questions about life, asking questions about their future. And then perhaps others wondering, you know, is God real? Is he interested in my life? And so, Lord, we trust you to simply speak to us, to guide us and lead us as we continue this journey with Zechariah. And thank you that just as you used Zechariah, Way, way back. So you long to use us, your people. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd quicken our hearts. And in the quietness, we would discover once again the power of the living God. Amen. Amen. Well, the series is titled, Charting Our Course into the Unknown. And there certainly are many unknowns in our lives and in our nation at the moment, aren't there? Well, last week we finished off at the end of chapter 2, verse 13, which said, Be still before the Lord, all humankind, because He has roused Himself from His holy dwelling. You remember where we are in the history of Israel, we've had the 70-year exile, we've had um, up to now 16 years of attempts at rebuilding the temple, which hasn't gone so well. We're a little further in now, we're another four years in, so we're about 20 years back. The building has kind of been start and fit, go, not go, um, sort of dusted off the foundations that were left, but things are still not going all that well, and God is using Zechariah and that last verse was, you know, be still, for uh, things will be revealed. And so we're into the fourth of the revelations of the visions that, that um, Zechariah was given. 
Well, it was an interesting week in our country, wasn't it? Because, um, you know, a couple of things have been revealed. I don't know if you've got your copy yet, but I got mine. And uh, fascinating stuff. Um, uh, Jacques Poe, a great guy. What a, what a courageous man. Him and Max Dupria. Uh, Max Dupria says, this is dynamite. Yeah, the president's keepers. Those keeping Zuma in power and out of prison by Jacques. Very, very, very courageous book, friends, and, and prophetic, I would, I would have you say. Uh, I would say, and certainly uh, Shirley and I have started reading it. We read uh, Max Dupree's, or Shaw's busy reading, I read it, um, Pale Native. Uh, also incredibly courageous uh, writing. And, of course, Poe had um, decided to retreat out of life. Um, in many ways, just like Zachariah. You know, he's living down in Rubik Castile. And uh, you know, he's off the mainstream journalism, as you know, courageously, you know, him and Max Dupree in those years of middle of the apartheid era, um, starting up Freya Wirkblatt, those opposing anti-apartheid structures, newspapers, um, their own people beginning to hate them for what they did. Um, and now, you know, he's awakened uh, once again. He's kind of in retirement. He says, for the first year of my self-imposed exile, I live, I happily slaved away at the Red Tin tin roof kitchen so they've got little restaurant little b&b he's down there in the western cape the holy land right there he is you know thinking life so that was until december 2015 when president jacob zuma fired his minister of finance uh nene and replaced him with anc backbencher des van royen nene was a proponent of stern fiscal discipline and cutting government spending to allow for growth and poverty alleviation that was not the priority for zuma he wanted control of the state purse. Doesn't that just stir your interest? Don't you want to get your copy right now? Um, don't pirate one. You know, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to get a copy, Dion. So he, he goes on to write, and um, he says, uh, I was watching uh, the spellbinding political drama with anticipation from my kitchen at Red Tin Roof before starting to cook and bake at five or six every morning. I scoured new sites from... Uh, for information on Zuma's attempts to capture the treasury. Like most South Africans, I realized that should a man accused of fraud and his henchmen lay their hands on the state coffers, it would be as fatal as handing an alcoholic the keys to his local liquor city. Get your copy, friend. So uh, much, is, much is being revealed. And really that's what's happening in the case of Zechariah. Much is being revealed about what's going on. We're, we're 20 years in now. It's as if chapter 3 of Zechariah is a little bit like getting in Genesis chapter 3. It's such an important text, these 10 verses which Ryan read to us. It's as if, you know, we've gone from, the, in, in the first of the series, we, we headed home, right? You remember that? Return to me and I will return to you. Then last week we looked at the holy jealousy of God. This, this beautiful thing that, that God owns us, that we are His. And he will not let us go. Not like human jealousy with all its kind of comparisons and unhealthiness. This holy jealousy that we are his and he won't let us go. He's calling us back to himself. And so today we're discovering this reality about, um, you know, the condition of our guilt. Um, you know, hence the intro with uh, our president. And the role that guilt plays in our lives. The constructive role actually that it plays. We've got three new characters in the story. We've got Joshua. This is Joshua the priest, not Joshua who let the walls uh, fall down. This is Joshua the priest. Uh, and I love it when Scripture gives you know, a specific amount of exiles that have returned. So we've got 49,697 exiles that have returned so far. How's that for Scripture being absolutely specific? Joshua is a priest, okay? He, he, in other words, he represents God to the people and the people to God. We've got the angel of the Lord, we've had him before, who is the pre-existent Christ. This is Jesus of the New Testament who pitches up in the Old Testament. Whenever he does, he's often known as the angel of the Lord. Could you say amen to that, friends? Jesus, before the foundation of the world, Jesus there in the Old Testament, Jesus who appears as a baby, goes to the cross and the resurrection. The same Jesus. He's the angel of the Lord. And then, of course, we've got Satan. That's why the comparison with Genesis 3. The accuser is present. He is here. And for some reason, as we chart our course into the unknown, this unknown future and all it holds, you know, right after holy jealousy, we start discovering about Satan's work, the accuser 
who is there. I mean, you wonder, you might even be wondering if Satan really exists. Some people struggle with a very personal devil. I don't struggle with a personal devil at all. I hear him whispering stuff in my ear regularly. And you've got to ask yourself the question, how, I mean, you know, just the presence of evil in the world. How can you have, um, you know, one man's influence over, over a nation? Like, for example, Adolf Hitler. How does it escalate from one man to a whole nation going astray? Talk about the Rwanda genocide. Talk about Serbia. Talk about our own nation currently being influenced by one man. The thesis of uh, Jacques Poe's kind of book, he puts it there in the first chapter. We're only about chapter two now, Charles and I. But the kind of thesis statement he makes is that the presidential kind of journey has simply become for him, how do I keep myself out of jail? And the people and the nation are way down on the picking order. Right up at the top is how do I keep myself out of jail? You still with me, friends? So the reality is that you know, for God's people, way back in Zechariah's day, they're battling to get on track. They're battling to get momentum in the rebuilding of the temple, which will define their worship life. We haven't started rebuilding the walls with Nehemiah yet. We're in the foundations of the temple, and we're trying to build. And so something of the story, you know, let's pick it up again. And he showed me Joshua, and standing before him, the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side. And so, friends, today as we... I want to propose to you that the understanding of our guilt, the condition of our guilt, determines our progress, whether we progress or not. So we've got three extremes. Well, we've got two extremes of, of guilt. Um, well, one, one on this side we're going to look at, and one over here we're going to look at, and then one that's going to put us right in the middle under the cross. And this one over here is just as unhelpful as this one over here. You, you, you ready for it, friends? So here's the first one. We'll call it guilt exploited. Guilt exploited. The accuser loves to exploit guilt. Uh, it, it results in a, self, a sense of false condemnation. We're over here. We feel bad about our guilt, but with nowhere to go. We feel bad about our guilt, but nowhere to go. He's called the accuser. That's actually his name. Satan means the accuser. This whole passage, it's like we're in a court of law. We're standing, the people are standing before God. But look at this reality, friends. Look, look where Satan is standing. Where is he in the text? He's at the right-hand side. He's at the right-hand side of the angel. He's at the right-hand side of God. He's at the right-hand side where you and I are in Christ. He's usurped our position. And he's accusing us before the Father. This is your position, my position. This is the church's position. This is our inheritance. This is who we are in God. And the accuser has taken that place and he's turned it around and he's accusing us before the Father. And he's saying we're condemned and we're guilty and we've got nowhere to go. This is guilt exploited, friends. It results in false condemnation. Satan has taken the place of authority, the place of ownership, the place of heritage. You might wonder, you know, you know, is this a kind of a new thing? If you look at Job chapter 1. You remember Job chapter 1 verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. <clears throat> Be nice if it just stopped there, right? But then it continues. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going to and fro over the earth. If you swing across to uh, John's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 44, I mean, what is Satan really like? The text clearly says, he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You getting the picture, friends? Guilt exploited. False condemnation. We feel bad about our guilt, but nowhere to go. It hangs heavily over us. That's what was happening to Joshua as he stood in front of God. Revelation 12, verse 10, just to, to, to let you know, it'll, it'll keep on going right till one day until Christ returns. Revelation 12, 
verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hauled down. In other words, one day the accuser will no longer be there. He will no longer have a place at all of trying to accuse us before the Father. He'll be thrown down finally that day when Jesus returns, that day when there's a new heaven and a new earth. Could you say amen to that one, friends? But until then, he's roaming around the earth looking for souls like you and I to accuse before the Father. And so Joshua represents the people of God. And one of the reasons they ain't making progress is because the accuser has got them in his grip. But it doesn't end there, does it? Because God loves us too much to leave us in this state, friends. The teacher asked her class um, what each wanted to become when they grew up. These were little fellas, okay? The president, the one said. I'm not sure about that in our country. A fireman, a teacher. One by one they answered until it came to little Billy's turn. It's always Billy's turn. The teacher asked Billy, what do you want to be when you grow up? Possible, Billy responded. Possible, asked the teacher. Yes, Billy said. My mom is always telling me I'm impossible. When I grow up, I want to become possible. You see, Satan will always accuse us falsely in a false condemnation way, and say, you know, for you to become a new person, to really live this new life in Christ, to really become what God wants you to be, is impossible. No, no, no. You're just a solid sinner. There isn't enough grace to rip you out of where you are for you to become. That's the accuser. And friends, he's very, very good at it. That's why he's called the father of life. Young Brian, aged five, had been told the story of the pillar monk, Simeon the Stylite, in Sunday school. He was captivated by this godly man's approach to seeking God's approval. Early Monday morning, he decided to imitate Simeon. He placed the kitchen stool on top of the table and climbed onto his perilous perch and began his journey towards sainthood. His mum entered the kitchen on that Monday morning, interrupted his holy pilgrimage by explaining, Brian, get down off that stool before you break your neck. Brian complied, but went storming from the room announcing, you can't even become a saint in your own home. He was just five years old. So there's the thing, friends, for us at all to become saintly, at all to make progress. It's as if we're in uh, Eden once again. Look at verse 2 in, in Zechariah in the text. If you've got your Bible or your app with you, uh, chapter 3 and verse 2. The, the Lord rebuked you, Satan. The Lord rebuked you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? In other words, here's Satan accusing accusing, accusing about salvation, about progress, about sanctification, about, you know, stuff that's going on in our lives, accusing us, accusing us. And God just reminds Satan who Joshua and therefore the people of God really are. Snatched from the fire. We were on a journey to hell, but we've been snatched from the fire. Isn't this a, a, a burning stick? In other words, he's mine. Don't you touch him. And that's who we are. That's who we are in God. God loves us too much to leave us in the state of feeling bad about our guilt with nowhere to go. It's guilt exploited. You with me? You've experienced it. Some of you are experiencing it right now. But God pursues us, doesn't he? As he pursued Adam with that beautiful question, Adam, where are you? Of course, Adam you know, does you know, the blame shifting thing and all that. But nevertheless, God. So, so you got this one over here. Guilt exploited, false condemnation, feeling bad about our guilt with nowhere to go. Do you want to live here, friends? Well, there's an equally bad place we can live. Right over here. An equally bad place right over here. We'll call it guilt suppressed. Guilt suppressed, false 
innocence. False innocence. We actually start feeling good about our guilt. Look at the text. Verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. In other words, Joshua the priest is at the priestly table. Uh, He's good to go. He feels he's ready to fulfill his priestly role. He's going to represent God to the people. He's going to represent the people to God. What's his problem? He's got filthy clothes on. Omo didn't do it. You know those adverts? I mean... You know, they'll convince you that this detergent is enough. They'll convince you, you know, this th- this will do it. But you know, there are some stains that they don't want to come out. And so, but Joshua hasn't just got a couple. He's got the whole nation's stains on him. His garments are filthy. But he thinks he's good to go. He's suppressed the guilt. The nation has suppressed. We start feeling good about our guilt. The irony is that Joshua, although he's ready to serve, and he's, he's feeling good about who he is. Uh, and, and, and you, you know, the language used for these dirty clothes, it's not just normal dirt. It's, it's sewer language. That's the, that's the language that's used in Zechariah. It's, it's, it's that kind of dirty. You know, sometimes if you, I don't know if you're a, a little person or a, or a bigger person, but there's two of you at the sink, Right? Or maybe you were younger and mom and dad were on the right. You were supposed to be, you know, washing the dishes and that was the rinsing one. You remember this? Uh, and, and, you know, as you, 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 you know, it might still happen to you. Sometimes it still happens to me. You know, you, you're cleaning the, the dishes and you think you got one really right and you're passing them on. And that person picks one up and very gently and lovingly gives it back. <laughs> yeah, you didn't do a good job on this one. You know that feeling? You thought you were, you'd done a great job. You scrubbed it top and bottom, but there was a spot that you missed. And so it's given back. And so that's what's happened to Joshua. He thought he had it all clean. You know, he's before God. He's ready to serve. But no, uh, his clothes are filthy. But friends, here's the good news. You know, guilt suppressed, false innocence, feeling good about our guilt. God loves us too much to, to leave us feeling good about our guilt. That's over here. This is exploited guilt on the far side with nowhere to go. This is uh, you know, false innocence over here. We suppress the fact that we are guilty. But look at Zechariah chapter 3. Look at verse 4 and the first little part. Just magnificent. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Isn't that good news, friends? Take off his filthy clothes. Clothes. Take him off. Because he's my son. She's my daughter. Yes, uh, there's a life. There's a battling life. There's a reality. But I'm God. I own this life. This is mine. The accuser, not yours. Take off those filthy clothes. This child of mine has got somewhere to go. This child of mine will be reinstated before me. And that's where we're heading with Joshua and his people. Take off the filthy clothes. At this stage, like we're back in Eden, naked, but still feeling ashamed. Still feeling ashamed. I think I'm okay, but I'm not okay. You know this kind of guilt, friends? We suppress it. We become familiar with it. It's been around so long, it just gets put in the cupboard. We start saying things are okay that are not okay. We call them white lies sometimes. But God loves us so much that he won't leave us feeling good about our guilt at all. As we go on into Zechariah, that second part of verse 4. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Isn't that what Jesus has done for us, hasn't he? Hasn't he taken off, you know, that dirty robe that you and I are clothed with? Hasn't he put his clean white robe of righteousness on you and I? And so, friends, right here in the middle, below the cross, 
We, 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 we've looked at guilt exploited. We've looked at guilt suppressed. But here it is, guilt confessed and guilt stripped away. Wouldn't you want to say amen to that, friends? Isn't that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And our president needs to hear that, right? But so do you and I, don't we? So do you and I, because we can get into this place of exploiting guilt through the accuser. We can get to this place. Because Satan would love us here as well, feeling um, you know, okay with our guilt and not dealing with it. He'd love us to spend time here and being ineffective in the kingdom. Putting on rich garments. Turn with me to 1 John. 1 John. John chapter 1. This lovely book of John. 1 John. Not the gospel. 1 John 1 verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. So that would be the spot over here on my right. This, this false innocence. That was Nicodemus's problem, wasn't it? Self-righteousness. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and just and will, will forgive us our sins and purify us from a little bit of unrighteousness. He'll purify us from all unrighteousness. This is our God, friends. Isn't he worth worshiping? You know, this is guilt stripped away. This is confession. This is true innocence because of what Jesus has done. Here we feel free from our guilt. It's taken away. We're given a new set of clothes. Where do you want to live, friends? Where do you want to live? Do you want to live here where the accuser is accusing you? Because he'd love you to spend time here. False condemnation. False guilt. Or do you want to spend time over here? False innocence. I'm okay, but I'm not okay. Guilt is still not dealt with. We're going to spend time here in the middle at the foot of the cross. And Zechariah gets in on the act. As you go back, Zechariah seems to start getting really excited about this whole reality. Then I said, this is Zechariah speed. You know, don't just give him some new garments. He says, put a clean turban on his head. Put a clean turban on his head. Let him look like a proper priest. Put a turban on his head. Let him do his job properly. Let him represent you know, us to God and God to, to us. He gets excited about it. Zechariah climbs on. So they put a clean turban on his head. And they clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. Now here's the critical part, friends. Here's, here's the critical part. You see, everything up till now has been unconditional, right? It's been unconditional. Um, you know, whether, whether we're going to stay there or not, that's, that's, that's God's grace is sufficient there. God's grace is sufficient here to meet us here. God's grace is sufficient there. It's everything God has done for us so that we can be innocent before Him. But that's not where it stops. Look at verse 6 and verse 7. The angel gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If... If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge in my courts. I will give you a place among these standing here. And so the progress we make is now conditional on our obedience to Jesus. The effectiveness of Joshua doing his work. He was going to walk. He needed to walk in God's ways. He needed to obey what God are you still with me, friends? So, so the good news is what God has done. The freedom we have. The freedom to serve. The freedom to be kingdom people. And if we were to regress into a sense of false condemnation or false innocence, we would regress. And this lovely charge to Joshua, you will govern you will have charge. You see, the president doesn't have the final say. God's people have the final say. His church has the final say. Are we not a kingdom of priests, friends? Are we not a holy nation? 
Are we not a people belonging to God? Called to declare the praises or the goodness of Him. Is that not you and I? Are we not a holy priesthood? It's not just this Joshua. It's His people. Representing God to the world. Isn't that a beautiful calling? And so Joshua, you know, as we walk in his ways, as we keep his requirements, we are given this authority to, to govern, to rule, to restore, to rebuild. And so this was the promise that, that the temple would be rebuilt, that the walls would be rebuilt. This is the promise that things are going to get better in our nation one day. Yeah? You're not looking convinced, friend. I'm doing my best here. I'm working hard up front. I'm telling you, God's done everything. But he is looking for people. Like he woke up Zechariah. Do you remember we started out in the movie, The Passenger? Do you remember the series started out in that movie? It started out, somebody was woken up. They were only 30 years into the 120 year journey. But someone was woken up because the ship was going astray. Well, the ship is going astray, isn't it? The nation is going astray. The church is battling to catch up. But someone was woken up. Zechariah was woken up. And, 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 and God is waking up people. He's woken up Jacques Poe. He thought he was going to retreat to Ruby Castile and have a lack of rest. And, you know, Max Dupree came along and said to him, Yeah, jy moet weer a book skryf, sien, Because you know about this stuff. You know about this corruption. You've interviewed these guys. We're in chapter 2 and he's in Moscow. And he's inter interviewing the guy who fleed the country. Because he was such a high-profile guy. He was put in such a high-profile state. And he's got a story to tell. But he's living over there. And so the first thing Max says to him, Jacques, je moet Moscow to go to go and get the story. And God wakes up his prophets, doesn't he? Because it's got to come into the light to be dealt with. Otherwise, it's just guilt exploited. Or it's just false innocence. And we go nowhere slowly. And so God's waking up his church, isn't he? Because the ship, you know, the spaceship and the passengers, as those who were woken up, shame, and he woke up the poor girl, didn't he? You know? And she was angry in the beginning. But then they realized their mission, to save the ship. And it was costly. And there was injury. And, and it is like that. I mean, Jacques Poe's already being threatened, isn't he? You know, they want to shut down the book. The state is on it. Just like the old times. You know? Just like the old times. Shut it down. Shut it down. No, 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 no. Don't shut it down. Bring it out. Bring it out. Get the book, friends, I'm telling you. But more important than that book, this book. This book tells us. You know, God wakes up his people. He woke up Zechariah. Seventy years of exile. 16 years, a lack of building. Another four years, the construction stop start, and he's still loving his people, still present with his people, still calling us out to be rebuilders, restorers. Oh, friends, I'm telling you, you know what's stopping you? You know what's stopping us? The accuser. We're sitting over here. Oh, man, I'm never going to become anything. I'm going nowhere slowly. You know, that sin I committed 20 years ago, man, that is still the biggest thing in my life. You know, that mistake I made, that is just, that's, you know, that's me. Or over here, no, well, I'm okay. No, 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 everything's fine. Everything's really fine. But actually, there's no fruit in my life at all, is there? No fruit at all. Or are we going to live here, friends, where there's true freedom below this cross, where there's true innocence because of what Jesus has done for you and I, His church, in this nation, in this country, where, where, where you know, the current struggle won't have the final say, where the praying, believing church will have the final say. Am I, am I going to get an amen, friends? But look at it. We're not done yet. We're nearly there. Look at the reality of what happens when we live this way. And I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land. 
in a single day. It is speaking about one day. It is speaking about what Jesus did on that day of the cross and the resurrection. It is speaking about one day when he returns. But it was speaking about Israel then. It's speaking about you and I today. Don't we serve an amazing God? Friends, he wants us reinstated and serving as a kingdom of priests, showing people God, showing people a hope. Showing people there's a God in heaven who is still in control. Father, we are humbled by your grace. That you would use us. You would wake us up. You would call us. You would cover us. You would give us new garments to wear. Friends, I'm not sure what <clears throat> your condition is today. You know, if you're sitting under a heavy cloud of false condemnation because the accuser has got the better of you. He's got the better of your family. He's got the better of some relationship. some heaviness that sits on you. And I'm telling you now, it's not from God. For we too, like Joshua, we've been snatched out of the fire. We've been chosen. And God is rebuking Satan on your behalf and my behalf, even now. Or maybe you're in a place of of false innocence, you know, saying everything's okay when you know everything is not okay. You know, the problem with that one, it's just like Adam and Eve. You end up making little garments that don't last, little coverings of fig leaves. And elke dag, as a groot wind is, dan weil ab. And we just go back to feeling naked and ashamed. Well, God doesn't want to feel us, make us, you know. He doesn't want to leave us there naked and ashamed. He will make these rich garments as he made them for Adam and Eve. As he slayed an animal then and he made garments of their skins for them. He covered their shame. So he slay his son on our behalf, friends. He allowed him to die. His own son, that we may be covered. Isn't that worth living for? Isn't that a grace worth receiving? And so that sin in your past, that struggle, you know, that mistake, that thing that's hanging over your life and my life, let's bring it to him. Let's let him take care. Let's today, let this be a day of guilt stripped away. True innocence flooding your being. receive that forgiveness and friends he doesn't want to leave you there he wants to reinstate you to your position to your calling to your place of service active and he's putting a rich garment on you even now as we confess our sin as we come clean to a holy God and he wants to reinstate you and reinstate your marriage Give you another opportunity to do it right. Reinstate you in the workplace. Maybe for some reason you've lost your authority. Wants to reinstate you. Your position has been usurped by Satan. He is not the one at the right hand of the Father. It's Christ who's at the right hand of the Father. And in Him, that's where your authority is. And in, in Christ alone, the cornerstone. So friends, let's not leave this place with guilt exploited or guilt suppressed or false condemnation or false guilt. Let's leave this place with guilt stripped away.
feeling free from our guilt. True innocence covered by the blood of the Lamb. When you leave this place, you can go and buy yourself a new hat. Just like uh, Joshua had a turban on his head. To declare what God has done. Let's stand together. And uh, let it sink into our hearts. That He loves us. That He cares for us. That we are innocent before Him. That He's calling us to Himself. To serve. To love. To change the world. Creed.